Hey everyone, it's Ken Rakowski. Of course, this is Metal Connect where we get to hang out with one of the amazing speakers from Saturday and learn more about what they're doing. This is an interactive session. Dive in, jump in anytime you have a question or comment, but this is specifically for the metal community. Now, when Stephen came on a few weeks ago, I thought just the wall of glory behind him had enough of a story. As he started to dive in deeper in what he was doing, he definitely knew there was a lot going on in this guy's mind. And I'm honored to have you here. And uh, first, Mr. Key, how do you describe yourself to other people? What do you say? Well, first of all, let me see if I get this connect. Is this working? Yeah, we got you. Okay, perfect. How do I describe myself? That's, yeah. um, I don't know, I'm just a creative guy and I wanted to be creative and design my life and not like, not just fall into a trap of working all the time. Although I work all the time now, but I love what I do. Mm, so, so you don't feel like you're working. Different. Yeah, but what, what, what do you, if you had to check off a little box saying, I am in this space, oh, in, what is that? I'm in the space of commercializing people's creativity. Okay, there is not a box in most places where, because most of the times it says your media, agriculture, education, government, what box would that be in? Is it advertising? Is it marketing? Is it, let, let's be broad first. Um, I would say innovation. Okay, I could take that. Innovation, but more on the creativity side of innovation, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm uh, all about breaking down barriers for people. I still and, like that you're being very generalized, but that's okay. Well, I, I think that if you're an entrepreneur and if you're a creative person, if you have some type of product or service and you really want to share that, you know, you want to commercialize that, that the traditional method is, didn't work for people like me. It just did not. I didn't want to start a company. I didn't want to hire employees. I didn't, I didn't want to do all that stuff. It just wasn't, um, it just didn't work for me. What I wanted to do is find a way I could, I could get companies to work for me. How's that? That's yeah, what I, I wanted that. to do. I, I got that. You know, most of the time when we have a successful business, whatever it is, we find a need and satisfy it, hmm. right? Did you obviously see that need that you were gonna satisfy? I just knew that I would have to create my own business because I didn't think anybody would hire me. <laughs> well, that's all entrepreneurs, by the way. Well, I, I don't know if all of them feel that way. I think a lot of people have some really awesome skills. I just didn't have much, but I knew I didn't wanna work for somebody. I knew that. and. And I also knew that I wanted to find something that I woke up every day and I was just pumped up. Are, are uh, you generally self-deprecating? Uh, all depends on my audience, probably. <laughs> just listening to you. So let, let's kind of dive into this space. We are in a COVID time. Yeah. And it's a very challenging time because most of the stuff you have behind you are things we would see in a store or we would see that would catch us because the, the idea of what you do is you want to catch your eye to draw us in to say, yes, I want, right? With the stuff in the back? Yeah. No, the, these, um, it was very, I don't know. It, it's, I didn't really think it through. These are <laughs> things that I either brought to market myself or my students have licensed. And I had all of it just in a box in the garage. And I thought, I, you know, I'm around it all the time. I'm just tired of it. I'm just around it. And I moved up to Lake Tahoe and I had it all in the box. I, do I throw it away or do I actually, I don't know, get it out of the box? So I, I, I started looking at it. I go, well, this is pretty cool. I remember this. And before you know it, I just put it in the back. And it's a, it's a really big wall. It, it's Holy cow, it's huge. Oh, oh yeah, it's not a it goes wraps around of products, but uh, it's a they're great just wall. fun things that I uh, that I love. And so I, I teach a class on entrepreneurship, and the very first class, I talk them out of being an entrepreneur. <laughs> I say it's a horrible idea. Your your chances of breaking up with your significant other has just doubled. Okay. Your chances of gaining weight has just gone up. Okay. Your chances of lack of sleep or sleep, uh, depriving yourself of sleep has just gone up. 
So many things are against you the minute you say, I want to become an entrepreneur. I need to talk you out of it. And the ones that stay around, I know they're the, they're the ones that are ready. Okay? Tell me about well, your, first, your first day of class. What do you teach? What's your focus? I, I think that you framed it correctly, that you better love it. You better be passionate about it or you will not survive it. Yes. And I, I also think that you're right about talking about some of the traps you're going to fall into, right? And you're going to miss a lot of things in life if you're not careful. Right. Because that I balance. think you're going to be so focused that you're just going to, things are going to pass you by. But, but, uh, but I also think I would talk about what that feeling feels like to when you hit one out of the ballpark. I would talk about that magic feeling when you see your product on TV mm -hmm. or when you walk into a, I remember the first product I designed ended up at FAO Swartz in New York and, and walking into that toy store and seeing something I made. I was, I was hooked forever. So I think you need to talk about that experience because once you get a taste of it, how do you let go of it? It's kind of like saying, I want to compete for the Olympics. Competing and winning a medal are very different. You know, really training, competing and winning is, so you look at the, how far back you got to go. Hey, one day I want to win a, a gold medal. All right, let's step all the way back. Do you even know the sport? You do good. Are you good at the sport? You're okay, great. Now you got to become great at the sport. I mean, you have to go all these levels. To have those type of wins, it's it's tough. The problem is guys like you talk about it. I don't it, think it's that tough. I, I think okay. there's few people at the top. I well, think I everything else is down below. <laughs> there you go. And so if you can shift your thinking to, to how do I get there? Who's there? How can I learn from them? How, how can I follow the roadmap a little bit, right? That's what I think. Find someone that's doing exactly what you want to do and then suck all that information out of them if you can. I think that's the fastest way on your, on your journey, right? And yeah. I also think that um, you better celebrate going up because you can come down just as fast. Yeah, it's so true. You know, and when you saw that first thing that you made at FHL Schwartz, how long did it take till it was knocked off, copied by somebody else? Well, it, it wasn't. I was, um, prior to that, I was selling things I made at street corners and, and county fairs and uh, state fairs. And everybody thought I was the biggest loser on the planet because I was making things myself and selling them. But I knew there is that exchange was pretty important for me to understand at that level. Got it. Um, so I'm never really attached to any of my ideas. I'm fascinated by, by how to bring them to market. I test them very quickly. But I don't love them. I mean, I, I like them. I think they're great, but I'm not in love with them. So I don't know if it ever got knocked off. What I've even cared, probably not. Um, I, I don't feel about it that way. I, I don't look at it that way. So guys that are watching, I want you to understand Stephen Key. He's got tons of books out there. His current book is called Becoming a Professional Inventor, The Inside Guide to Companies Looking for Ideas. And as Stephen starts to dive into the where he's at and how he sees that. I like the idea of a professional inventor. What's the difference between a professional and an amateur inventor? Well, that's why I wrote the book. I wanted to find out. Oh, you, you were on the journey. Well, I think I knew, but I wanted to ask the companies, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? So uh, I felt I knew, but I, I didn't, I wanted to write it from their perspective. So I interviewed 30 different companies in 17 different industries. And I wanted to know from big companies like Conair to Hasbro to a list of smaller guys, mid-sized guys, everybody. And what, what came out of it was a little shocking. It, it was really about relationships. Mm. And most inventors are thinking about me, me, me all the time. Right. And you really have to put yourself and think about them. And once you make that shift and you realize it's a teamwork, then you're not in such a hurry or panic, right? Because relationships aren't built that way. You have to take it a little slower. You really have to understand what their business is. You have to understand their business for you to really be an asset to them. So 
when I wrote when I wrote the book, I was just um, I couldn't stop interviewing companies. I was fascinated by it, and they gave me access. So that guide is not what you have done. It's not what you have licensed. It's not what you have commercialized. It's how you present yourself. Mm, give us an example. Um, you, the way you reach out to a company, you know, most inventors, like I said, are really thinking about themselves. But if you try to understand their process, if you try to understand their product line, their mission statement, their culture, if you do that work up front, you've, you're starting to invest in them a little bit. And they can tell by the questions you ask, by the comments you make, that you're serious. You're, you're a serious player, that you're probably going to come back again. If, if you are jumping around like speed dating and venting, you're, you're throwing an idea up against the wall. It doesn't work that way. Those companies know that. And they know that your first idea probably won't get licensed. But they also know if you hang around long enough and let us give you feedback, the chances just increase tenfold. So it wasn't what I expected. Again, give me a better example of a company that you interviewed and it, it validated your premise that they're a professional as opposed to an amateur when it comes to as an inventor. Let's take, um, let's take Hasbro. Everybody knows Hasbro. Sure. 50%, uh, 60% of their product portfolio comes from outside inventors. They're the uh -huh. largest company by revenue toy company in the world. And they have two portals. They have the one portal that you go in and you're amateur. They have another portal, you're a professional. Okay. If you happen to think you're an amateur, you go in this one portal and they know it right away. And, and they just know the chances of, of you being successful are gonna be a little smaller. So they kind of just put you in this pile. If you don't even go in the portal and build relationships through LinkedIn or trade shows or whatever, they, put you, they automatically put you in that pro portal. Really? It, 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 it surprised me how they can evaluate you. See, they are interviewing you as much as your product because they have to bring you in, right? If, they, if they're not comfortable bringing you into their world and you embarrass them, big mistake. So there's telltale signs. They can also tell an amateur move might be talking about how big the opportunity is. That's an amateur move, right? You, you never tell a company about their business. They know their business, right? Another amateur might, might move uh, would be to when you reach out to them for the first time, you're pitching. You don't pitch the first time, right? I mean, who wants to be sold all the time? Right. No one does. Talk to me. You know, who are you? What are you doing? What are your goals? What are your goals? And, and do enough homework that you know their product line so you can talk to them at a, a, a different level. So slow it down. They can tell. If you're in a hurry, if you're rushing and you're pitching and you're talking about billions of dollars, Amateur move. Wow. A lot to judge based upon that. I know Edwin's joining us. Hey, Edwin, who of course has created many people in the group know a, 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 a car game, card game. Oh. And uh, that card game, you had some, you had a big, big talent attached to the card game. And you told me at times that that was actually a, a hindrance because of the talent itself, right? You want to explain that? No, absolutely. We were working with Ludacris. And at the time, you know, when he came on board, he was really, really excited. And then, you know, later when he, when he saw that we wanted him to actually do work, he, he said that there were conflicts with Fast and the Furious and this and that. So we started with the app and then we pivoted to a tabletop card game, um, which we launched right before COVID. But somehow in a strange way, it's actually worked out for us. We're on, uh, you know, Amazon, we're on walmart.com, we're on uh, bedbathandbeyond.com. And Rob Angel, the inventor of uh, Pictionary, has come on as an advisor, which is great. And he's made some introductions for us. Um, but it's great to really hear you talk about 
the amateur stuff because uh, you know, as we're starting to go into these meetings, uh, now I know kind of what not to to say and do. So I really, really appreciate those and any more of those you can share, I think are, are great. Well, that would be actually kind of a good idea. Let's, if you, Stephen, by the way, Stephen and Rob are, are buddies. So it, it, it's good to, you know, there's a connection. It's a small world out there. Yeah. If you would take on somebody like Edwin going, all right, Edwin, it's a good game. But are you the right guy to represent the game? Or let's make you the right guy. So a Hasbro or a Mattel is going to like you. Is that what you got to do? You almost got to take the inventor and make them look like a pro? Well, not look like a pro, be a pro. Okay. Okay. And that's understanding that industry a little bit, right? I mean, the first thing you really understand who the players are. And there's two things that someone said to me that make perfect sense. And Richard Levy that sold 75 million Furbies, one of the top toy designers, he says, Steve, it's two things. It's what you know and who you know. Mm -hmm. Now, what you know is staying in that industry long enough that you know the players and you know what they specialize in. Most people that just start out the gate, they think Hasbro Mattel, right? Because right? that's that those brands they know. But there's so many other companies that are going to treat you a little bit differently, going to look at you differently, are going to be hungrier for your ideas that still have great distribution. So when you reach out to a Hasbro or a Mattel, you're really playing in the NBA. You're going from my 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 kitchen table to the NBA or the NFL. Why would you want to make that jump? That's not a great jump. The royalty rates are going to be lower. They're not going to treat you as well. They're not going to let you into their little world. What you want to do is go down a little, little step down a little bit, step, step down to that mid-sized company, which is still huge, and start the relationship with those guys. They're going to love you more. They're going to treat you better. They're going to bring you in for you to get to the NFL. So I think there is a, something that people don't understand about the, the understand the landscape of the, who the players are. And then once you stay in it long enough and they get to know you, you have to invest in them. Then now it's who, you know, so it's what you know and who, you know, that's how you win at this game. So it's not just your big idea you're, cause you're going to have a lot of ideas. It's a long game. It's not a short game. It's a long game in every business relationships, know who's, who the players are, know what the culture of the companies are, and be that professional that they can count on you and bring you in. Got that, Edwin? Yes, I, I do. That's, that's great. There, there's another guy I can introduce you to. His name is Ken Johnson. Ken Johnson wrote the second, in fact, he has the second best selling card game in the is world. It, is it phase 10? Phase 10. Yeah, he's he's an advisor as well. Okay, good guy. He's, <laughs> what you're going to find that I think the guys that have gone up and made it down a couple times, and everybody knows that, they're willing to share. Yes. They're willing to reach down and pull the next guy up. Absolutely. Right. And uh, those two guys, um, Rob and Ken, are those two type of guys that are willing to help. So good, good guys. It's, it's ironic. I, I just saw what Matt just wrote. And Matt, I want you to hear this. Uh, one of Stephen's books is calling Selling Your Ideas Without a Patent. <laughs> now, the reason I'm bringing this up, Matt, Matt's an attorney. Patents are important. Woo! But, but oh, oh. are they? Do you really no. know? No, no. Well, you, you, can I, can I um, interject? Of course, Matt. Thank you. It's not it's just about patents. It's intellectual property, whether it's a, a, a copyright, a trademark, a trade secret, you know, patents are inventions and that, that's a whole different um, ball of wax. And, okay. And, and hold on uh, just for one second. You know, oftentimes um, early inventors or uh, inventors or authors of games or contests or whatever it may be, um, sign these agreements that they don't understand what they're signing away with the companies that they're working with. And so, Stephen, I'd, I'd love to hear you um, give some guidance to early um, inventors of, of whatever it may be as to how they can protect their intellectual property rights. 
Well, thank, thank you. Um, I'm a patent holder. Proud. I'm a proud patent holder, over 20 patents, defended my patents against a little toy company, Legos. Lego. <laughs> um, I kind of understand it. I write about it for Forbes Intellectual Property from a business perspective. You don't own anything anymore. I am sorry to say it. I don't think it's a problem, though. I look at it from a different perspective. Um, I'm a big believer you should own your creativity. I think that's why people create is to own it. It's just a little bit difficult to, to protect it and get paid for it. All right. Mm. Okay. I like all the tools and I don't think patents are the, the major tools today. I think if you've got design patent, I mean, design patent, a copyrighted trademark, that's probably better for online selling today because you can use those three tools to stop those copycats because they copy you exactly. So, it's not even the patent anymore. There's other tools. I also believe that if you're if you're using patents for, for, a, for a protection mechanism, you're looking at it wrong. Because today, to even get the federal court is probably pretty hard. If you sue someone today, they're going to file an IPR at the USPTO, and you're going to get stuck over there. Now, that's just kind of what's happening. But that doesn't bother me. In fact, I think it's the best time in the world to have intellectual property, but use it differently. Use it as perceived ownership. Understand that those tools are great tools. You can raise money by those tools. You can keep the honest people honest by those tools. You can stop some of the online sellers. You can do all these things. But to think that you're gonna eat this cherry pie, that you work so hard, that I think you're mistaken. I think you have to, possibly share part of that slice with a few other people now, but the market's gotten bigger. I do believe the fight of, of fighting of copycats is not, shouldn't be done in court. I think the fight is gonna be on social media now, right? Because I think us creative people have a powerful voice today and we have to use it. We have to build a community of like-minded individuals on LinkedIn or wherever you build it build a base of raging fans, help the community and the community will help you. So I'm a big believer in, in, in taking the time to really building community. I, I'm a big believer in that because you're gonna pull those people when you need them. Back in the day, if I had a problem with the company, I would call their customer service and I wouldn't get anywhere. Right. Today, I post on their Facebook page. And they call me with 10 minutes. Okay, they can't spend tens of millions of dollars, I mean, hundreds of millions of dollars on their brand to get destroyed on social media. They can't do it. So if, if we shift our thinking of thinking this intellectual property is really important, but how do I use it in today's world? Because I, I'm not gonna go to court. I don't wanna end up PTAB. I don't wanna poke anybody in the eye. I don't wanna threaten anybody but I wanna use the power of my community to apply pressure on the situation for people to act appropriately. Yeah, but, but you have the power of the community because of um, many other factors. There are a lot of inventors and authors and so on and so forth and trademark holders that don't have the kind of power that you have. And I'm not saying that litigation is the uh, first step that one should take. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, I don't, think that that is what should be done but <clears throat> well no. i'll give you a good example a friend of mine was selling a product on qvc did a great job amazon great job some of the retailers and sure enough he got knocked off by target so you know you don't sue a retailer if you do they're never going to carry your product ever <laughs> all right so so what do you do and the litigation is so expensive, so time consuming, blah, blah, blah. He just called it the buyer at Target and said, hey, look, I'm the original, I'm the original guy. Here's my intellectual property. And, and he was so well known because of the Facebook and the LinkedIn that he said to the buyer, look, I don't want you to take it down, sell it through, just sell it through. But I'm the guy. Target took it off and ordered his product. He won by being nice. Now, that to me is a change. 
right? Because I, run, I wonder how rare of a story that is. I think it's happening more and more. I do believe there's always going to be some bad players, of course, right? But I have a product called Fishbone Packaging. It eliminates the plastic rings on six packs of beverages. We have it on small players here in the United States. I got knocked off by Coke and Heineken in the UK already. Yeah. Okay. So what do I do? Do I threaten those guys? You can't threaten them. It's impossible, but I'm going to leverage their success and bring it on over to what I'm doing because now that product is acceptable. It's being accepted in the marketplace. I'm going to turn a bad situation into a good one. So I think we just have to shift our thinking a little bit. Um, things are always changing and entrepreneurs, we're smart. We're always having obstacles. We're always having problems. Think differently. Of, of how to navigate those situations so they're not problems, but they're opportunities to do some great things. Makes all the sense in the world. Guys, you have a question or an idea, you wanna jump in, just let me know, put inside the chat. Uh, Steven's with us for the next uh, 30 minutes. And the idea of coming up with inventions and ideas and utilizing social media, all top of market right now, because let's face it, social media is a lot easier than it used to be. It is, there's more tools out there, it's harder to get your voice heard. You know, you, you mentioned Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter. Is there anything that you use that might be a little more obscure? Or are you using only the, the primary ones, including YouTube? Uh, I'm using basically LinkedIn. We use the other ones to, to, to show a transparency of who we are. See, I, I believe today you, you don't sell. You, you, you show you how authentic you are, all right? That's nothing new, but I think you, you don't sell, you, you service your industry or service your customers with good products. You care, truly care about them, make a difference and they'll line up out your door. Um, I don't think you right. sell anymore. I think there's too much noise to sell and I don't wanna compete with the noise, it's ridiculous. Um, also, I don't believe you have to say what you're going to do, do what you're gonna do it, just do it and people will see it and they'll follow it. I like LinkedIn. I Just like how LinkedIn. Get, how do you get above of, all the noise in LinkedIn? You start an account, you start off with nobody when you start your account. How do you get recognized? Well, and connect with me and you're going to connect with my 10,000 friends. And then my 10,000 friends have 30,000 friends. That's how you do it. It's not hard. I mean, think about this for just a minute. My community of inventors are out there and we, we have a class every two weeks on LinkedIn of how to build like-minded individuals together. So we start to all connect, we all start to connect and we share and we comment and we support. Now I know you're, you, you understand this because we're all here talking about this now and you all know how important it is and you know what the difference is making now. But if you can blow that up a little bit, but you have to participate, you can't be on the sidelines. You have to, you have to, add value to the conversation. But what happens is, can you imagine that you keep on doing that and supporting that industry? There's no way you cannot reach a million people. The math just grows. And I don't know why more people aren't looking at it that way. So we have a policy to where we shine lights on another people. We always believe if I shine the light on somebody else, that, that reflection is gonna come back on me. So we, as a group, keep helping each other and just grows, just keeps on growing. Yeah. So that's how, that's how you have a powerful online community and it doesn't take long. And it goes back to what you said to Edwin and to the group, and that is, it's not about the product, it's about the relationship. So in a lot of ways, it's about you first. It's about you as the originator of this idea. I, it has to start with that first connection. It has to start with that first investing in that person. You have to give it yourself to get back. And I don't think you can give enough. And if you learn that, if you learn the, 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 the simple, I think, universal truth, I don't, whatever you give, give away or whatever you give, you get back tenfold and never expect a return. And what you're gonna find the most amazing things are going to happen in your life. Mm -hmm. All right. Edwin, you want to ask a few of those questions? Go for it. 
Yeah, I have two questions. Uh, number one, how do you determine whether or not to move on a new invention? Like what's what's that process like? And then the second one is, how do you find the balance of being on social media and pursuing your inventions and making them come to reality? Well, I, I do something a little different. Um, I believe, I learned, I had mentioned I was selling things on street corners and I learned something really quick. You need to be able to test an idea really fast if you wanna pay the rent. So I'm a big believer in, in, in testing. I'm a, I'm a really big believer in selling the benefit of an idea first. See, that goes against what we've been taught. You know, we've been taught we have an idea, we're gonna file patents, build prototypes, build a company, and then see if anybody wants it. That's ridiculous. That's a, that's a recipe for failure, for heartache, what you were talking about. I say, let's flip it. Why don't we sell the benefit first? And why don't we do it with a simple one page advertisement? Why do you even build a prototype when I can do a 3D computer generated sample for 50 bucks? Why don't I do all the things a one-line benefit statement that grabs someone's attention that, that really says, hey, this is why you should care. All those things that I can float out to companies and go, what do you think? Now, what does that cost me? Very little. How much time does that take? Very little. So I believe you become an idea factory because I don't think it's one idea, two ideas, three ideas. I think it's gonna be multiple ideas. And so once you change your thinking and start designing for companies' needs, looking at their product line, focusing, looking at the holes, and knowing you could outdesign them because you're fast, you're quick, right? We think it's being small as an obstacle, independent. I think it's your biggest asset is being small, being quick on your feet. And if you can, can look at it that way, I can target any company. Look at their product line, look at their price point, look at the reviews, and I can outdesign their in house designers. And I'll tell you the reason why. Designers, creators work because of not of the money, because of the creation. So if I'm designing for a company, I want to go home at five o'clock. I'm getting a paycheck. I don't get recognized. I'm the most frustrated artist on the planet. Us, we're on fire. We want to work Saturday, Sundays, Mondays. We can't stop. We cannot stop thinking about it. We have the power to outdesign them, outthink them. We just got to show them those ideas. Make sure they're inventor friendly. Make sure we do the correct intellectual property that's appropriate. And make sure we do that intellectual property correctly because I don't think that's even done correctly these days. I think you need to match your business objectives with what your IP is. Make sure it's a good fit. That's good IP. So I do believe getting back to your question, be careful on working on one idea forever or for a long time. Don't do that. Test it quick, test it fast. It doesn't work, kick it to the curb and come up with another one. You had a second question? Social media, right? You asked about social media? Yeah, I like it, for me, I, I really find myself every time I get on social media, I fall into this hole and I look up <laughs> and it's three hours later and it's a lot of negativity. So I try to stay off of it, but I see that you must have an audience to really build your products and, and gain a following. And we use some of our following to test our products. So how do you find that balance between the two? I think it's hard. I, I think you can fall in that trap. I think we all do. I think you have to wear different hats. For me, the first hat in the morning will be my business hat. Those are the things I'm better in the morning. Those are the things I really don't really like to do. So I put my business hat on. I do all the crappy stuff I don't like. A little bit later, I, I reward myself with the creativity because I think you have to stretch that muscle daily, right? So I, I kind of separate them because the business is hard. It will crush your, your inner child. You got to protect that inner child. So I separate them as far as I can. So I reward myself, but I find time during the day to check on the social media because I can learn about trends. I can see what people are thinking, but I have to jump into it every once in a while. But I do fall the same trap. Once I get in it, something's interested, I got to get back out of it. So that's something that I think we all need to work on, right? But if you're saying, look, I'm only going to do it for 30 minutes a day, that's not going to be enough. 
All right. It just won't be. I, I think I like to do pockets first thing in the morning, see what's going on, nail it, do some other stuff, have some fun, find some other place. And I just jump in during the day. But I find it more fun and relaxing when I do it that way, too. It's not a job. I like people. But there, right. but there is a difference on social media, because if you start to say Facebook, LinkedIn uh, and Twitter, LinkedIn is not used throughout Asia, South Africa, um, Indonesia. Uh, Twitter is not used amongst a certain age group. It's kind of innocuous. Uh, if you go to Russia, it's VK. If you go, I mean, literally social media is different in different parts of the world. So if you're creating a relationship with somebody in China, they're not on Facebook. Well, my, my world, I, I tell everybody, it's a big world out there. And of course you want to own it all. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I tried and that's that easy to do. Okay. Um, I, I have to kind of really lay, laser focus what I'm trying to do. And so the U.S. to me is as, as big as I want to play, although I do play in different parts of the world, right? But uh, I start there because most of these companies in the U.S. have long arms. You know, most of these big companies I'm dealing with now, they're everywhere too. Mm -hmm. So I focus on LinkedIn because that's easier to reach out to companies especially during COVID, it's so easy to get to everybody now. There's no gatekeepers. There's none of that stuff. You can get to anybody. Sure. Um, I like it because it's fast. You can get a response within minutes sometimes. You, you can, but you have to do it as a professional. And I just wrote a book, Licensing Ideas Using LinkedIn, just because of what's happening. I believe as an educator, um, you have to be current. That's why being on those sites is being a little current, interviewing people, being current, reading as much as you can. And if, if, that's a, if, that, if you feel like that's a job, then you need to find someone that can do it for you. <laughs> it's true. It's true. CK? Okay. Hey, Stephen. Thanks Hi. for being here. So many questions, so many things to unpack, but I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. So if I understand you correctly, you, you keep a wide lens to look at the trends and then you look at specific companies and you look at the specific opportunities within the company and then you pitch the, the key holder in the company as a way to bypass all of that. So that's the context. The question I have for you is, do you also run Facebook ads or Kickstarter as a way to bring that data to the key holder to say, hey, I have this many people sign up, this and that? Well, that's a really great question. I don't do that. But I can tell you by interviewing um, successful inventors or even companies that are, are really interested in building relationships, they like if you have an audience. And that's really interesting today. I, I hadn't looked at it that way. They like that you've got a community, an audience, you've got a voice that has value to them. Um, when a company licenses an idea from you, there's no story there, but you're the story, right? And, and that, that is gold. I mean, that's a, that's a currency on social media. You have a story to tell and you can tell it. So you have a lot of value if you work on that part of your business. So uh, I don't particularly use it that way, um, but if I was a little bit younger, I would show my creativity. I would be transparent. I would show who I am as a person. I would make those connections with all those people and grow my audience. Uh, I think it's easier today, but you know, it takes work, it takes a big investment, right? And I also believe that you, you should be very careful about social media because those platforms can disappear. So if your business is based on any type of social media platform, I'd be scared. I think you'd need to, to, to look at that very seriously and, and make sure you get all those emails over to you. That's, I guess my point I'm making. Yeah, so I don't do it that way, but I, I think some people do, yeah. Could I ask a follow-up yeah. question real quick? Yeah, go for it. So you had advice to uh, Edwin to test quickly. In your mind, how quickly is quickly? Because it's all about iterations, right? So how quick is your iteration from idea to validation to deal. I'm a nut about being fast. I have a sense of urgency. If I have an idea in the morning, I want to know by the afternoon, am I crazy or not? I mean, 
I'm, I'm a crazy inventor and I'm, a, I'm one of those crazy people. I want to know, am I going to work on something that's never going to return a dime or no one's ever going to see the light of the day? No, that drives me nuts. When you have an idea and you something brilliant happens and you go, oh my God, something just happened to me. And, and you don't know who, even who to ask, but you know there's magic there. I want to know if I'm crazy. So what I'll do, and this is the process I, I try to teach the people, if you, if you build a network of companies that you're working with, they know you, and you can produce a sell sheet, a one-page advertisement, which doesn't have to be fancy, but really shows the benefit. If you learn those tools, I would come up with an idea at eight o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock, build a sell sheet, file a PPA, and reach out to a company by noon. That's moving fast. And that's telling me, that's giving me some read, not all the information I need, but it gives me enough read to go a little bit further. It motivates me. So I'm all about urgency and, and not just waiting, not overthinking it. That, that kills it. And, and things that don't have to be perfect. If, you're, if you think things are being perfect, you're going to lose. I say, everybody, if it's 75% there, ship it. You can fix it on the way down. You can fix it later. But I want to read quick. I like that. So as you look at today's world of making something and getting it out, do you think that you need to use existing platforms also? So like Amazon's a platform, Etsy's a platform. Do you like to leverage platforms or do you feel direct to consumers the best way? I'm really the wrong guy to ask. That, well, that's not my specialty, but I can tell you this, what I do know. It's easier today than it ever has been. Right. I can I can target. I forget, forget Amazon. I can target, I can do Facebook ads on if I want to sell chocolate chip cookies to some grandma in Kansas City now. Are you kidding me? I, that, whoever thought that could happen? So, and that's so inexpensive that I can keep on targeting and I can keep on switching my pitch up. I can do whatever I want just to test. And if I got a product to sell, even better. So we have we have full control now. Yeah, but there's a cost to that. So if you say, hey, I'm going to test, you're going to have to have a budget of X. You're going to do orders on demand, obviously, right? Because you don't want to carry inventory. That's the one thing you don't want, right? I wouldn't right. carry any inventory at all. Right. What I would do, I would run an ad. I'd play with that. I think, I think that's where you need to play with it. And I would really narrow my my target. So it's not very expensive because if I can duplicate it in Kansas city, there's a good chance I can get grandma in San Diego. Okay. So one, one, one of our metal members is a guy named uh, Alan Lee and he did exploding kittens, right? Incredibly successful, but he kind of gamified it. He, he figured out how to really tempt, excite and reward along the process. I mean, he's, he's kind of a God at it, but he also, no, you I know, but I can test without even having inventory, right? I can do a dry test. I don't even know if I have the product or not. That's right. what I would do. do that often? And because he theoretically did the same thing. He, he found out then later on how many cards he would need. And he went to the cards for yeah. humanity guys to become partners. And he did all that. I, I, I mean, you could, God, the whole Amazon thing has changed too, uh, I, I think. But you have to be careful from what I understand and the people I talk to all the time. You know, even on Amazon, you've got to you've got to create demand, folks. You just have to. You you have to be the ability to people to find you. And that that's not easy, right? No. That takes work. Um, so, you know, my wife I had mentioned earlier. She's a she was a vice president of Gallo Winery, the highest ranking woman in the history of the company. And when we got married, we, we met each other at Worlds of Wonder. And I thought ideas were everything. It all comes, it, all, it, it was just the idea that made everything. And she kept on saying, you're out of your mind. <laughs> and I finally realized my wife was right. And she's been right ever since. You got to create demand. And, and that's not easy to do. And if you have that formula to create it and have the right product at the right price point and find the right customer, you can sell the shit out of it. So let's go, let's go behind you. Show us some of those products that you did exactly what you said. Found the right price point, you got the consumer and you marketed the crap out of it. Now, social platforms. Well, I'll show you one. 
You're gonna love this. Um, I was the largest supplier of guitar picks in the world. Oh, that's awesome. Do you play guitar? No. <laughs> it, it was better that I didn't. So how would you market that then? How would you I, say, I mean, I'm gonna do guitar picks. That's a cool one. I, I mean, this. look at this. Now, now, here's what's crazy about that. If I was a guitar player, I wouldn't have changed the shape. And if I was a guitar player, I wouldn't realize there's more fans than musicians. Right. All right. So we um, we came up. Uh, I mean, look at this one. Look at this one here. <laughs> Do you know awesome. how many I sold of these? Yeah, but how we, much IP did you break on Disney by doing that? I had to pay them 10%. Okay. And the minimum guarantees for three years were $50,000. I made that in the first three months. It was nothing. I, love I also, uh, I did uh, Taylor Swift guitar picks at all our concerts. We were selling guitar picks everywhere to the fans, although you still use them. No, smart. Now, now, let me tell you what's even crazier about this. Um, I thought they would sell at 7-Eleven. Now, if I walked in corporate 7-Eleven and go, hey, I, I want to sell guitar picks, they would say, Steve, we don't have that many musicians that come in the stores. Are you out of your mind? So I took a display, went down to the local 7-Eleven. He was a friend of mine. I said, could you put it on the counter? He said, are you really, you want to put those on the counter? I said, just do it for me. I'll come back in a couple of days. Come back in two days. And it's gone from the counter. That's precious real estate, I know. I thought, this bombed. Comes back and go, well, how did it do it? He goes, we sold out. Now, that was really kind of an amazing little experiment. So next thing you know, the regional manager called me and said, hey, look, I, I just heard you had something that sold out that fast. Did your friends buy it? I said, no. He goes, let's do a test with seven more stores. So I said, no problem. I gave them the product. Don't even pay me. I want the test results. We put them in seven more. They all sold out again. And that's when we rolled out national, the 7-Eleven. We even sold at Walmart. We were the number one small accessory selling at Walmart with a piece of plastic. Now, how, how do we build that audience? Now, that's the part I loved. This is when MySpace was just created, right? MySpace. Maybe people don't remember that, but it wasn't that long ago. And I try to get big companies, big musicians to endorse my guitar picks. And they just held their hand out. They said, sure, give us money. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any money. So I thought, well, why don't I endorse garage bands? Because there's a lot of garage bands. And I'll find them on Facebook. And I'll do, I'll do a contest once a month. And whoever gets the most votes for the picks, I'll put an ad in Guitar Magazine. And that just blew up because every garage band in America wanted to be endorsed by Hot Picks and have an ad in Guitar World Magazine. That's how we got from zero to huge so fast. And we put our website on the back of every one of them. So every time a garage band went on tour, they threw them out. So it just grew and grew and grew and grew. Before you know it, we were selling them all around the world. And the marketing was helping those garage bands. God, what a brilliant idea. That's all so it was. Simple. So, so simple, but you cornered the market. Our supplier was Jimmy Dunlop. Dunlop was selling more guitar picks in the world. And when I was on the show, Donnie Deutsch, uh, back a few years ago, showing those guitar picks, he called me up and said, we've been doing this 30 years. You just cleaned my clock in a couple of years by selling to the fans. <laughs> wow. So that was a, so, I guess that was a social media play early on, right? And I don't know if it was, um, it was a community based again, but it was looking at what people needed. And those garage bands were never going to get an endorsement from anybody. 
And when we said we will endorse you, they all signed up and they bought the picks at cost and they exploded it. Yeah. Yeah, but you flipped the model. It wasn't the obvious being the bands, it was the fans. That's, fans. That there is where it's, it's mind blowing. It seems so obvious, obviously looking at from the other side. Well, here, well, here's the other thing that was really kind of crazy about the whole thing. If you went to a music store, they had guitar picks in a, a tackle box. I mean, and they were selling them for, I don't know, whatever. We, we made them for three cents and basically sold them for 99 cents <laughs> because we put them in a different package. We put them in a package like this. Like here's my Taylor Swift ones. We put them in a package so they were actually branded now. Mm. I mean, that was easy pickings. I mean, when I look back at that and realize that was a sleeping dinosaur. I think you need to look for sleeping dinosaurs, things that haven't changed in years. And you just look at them differently. And, and that's, the, that's the one thing that I found fascinating by, by looking at the situation and go, you know, let's just change it. You know, why does it have to be that way? I'm looking at Harry right now. I know Harry's going sleeping dinosaur, sleeping dinosaur. Ooh, that right. Am I right, Harry? That's percolating in your brain right now, right, Harry? Yeah, that's brilliant. And selling to the fans instead of the musicians. That is, that, yeah, you unlocked a couple of things there. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Well, yeah. it, it was, yeah. we went from a kitchen table with my kids putting them in the packets to 30 employees selling around the world. Uh, but it drove me nuts. You guys, you have to realize I, I went nuts there because um, licensing is my, my specialty. And now I had a business. The, the first Walmart order was for a half a million dollars and I had to float a quarter of a million dollars myself because the bank wouldn't loan to me and I didn't want to factor it, all the kind of stuff. So we did all of it, but at the end of the day, it didn't fit my personality. Can I ask a question, Ken, real quick? Just, Stephen, you've been talking about products and they're all amazing and brilliant. Have you ever licensed an idea, some creative or you know, more intellectual property? to a company as, as opposed to manufacturing the product, you know, handling that? You can license just about anything. Yeah. And I'm sure people are gonna get really rattled when I say this too. You can license things that are not protected. What? And this rattles everybody and it rattles a whole industry. And I do a lot of speaking at the USPTO and they know exactly who I am, and I'm going to tell you, 95% of all patents never make a dime. They don't make enough money to recoup the costs. So you have this big elephant in the room. You have a, this whole huge industry, right, of no success. But no one wants to talk about it. But I, what I see each and each day now, that all the ideas that are getting licensed, there's no intellectual property. There's a well-written provisional patent application but it never goes to patent because it's speed to market now. Sell first, sell fast. It's not about fighting with your competitors. It's not about that. It's about being quick on your feet. So I like, we, this, with the fishbone packaging, hopefully everybody will look at that. That's my next big project. We, um, that's rolling out now. Uh, the licensing deal was with a billion dollar company. And guess what? The grant of license, what am I licensing to you, does have nothing to do with intellectual property whatsoever. And if you type in the definition of a licensing agreement, it says you're licensing intellectual property. <laughs> and I just threw that out the door because it's about goodwill. It's about business. It's about know-how. It's about everything it has to do. Then some patent examiner, 10,000 Pan examiners, one in a little cubicle, tell me what I own and what I don't own. That just got thrown out the door. You know, I'll, I'll, can I jump, just jump in real quick and that I'll say, uh, having worked uh, with a lot of entrepreneurs and startup companies, a lot of people, uh, uh, Stephen, believe what you say, and that's get out to market, do out compete, out compete, and um, that's your intellectual value and intellectual property right there. Yep. 
Yep. It's a fun world. It well, just got it, better. It's not first to market. It's not first to market. It's out to out compete anyone else that is in the market then too. I, you know, it, it's, I, I think you have to have a good business. I think you need to run a good business and good customer service. And I think it's all those things, right? And um, being first is gonna be helpful. I think I like the licensing business model because I can license to a, a fairly large player that's got great distribution and he's going to get it out there fast. And he's probably going to have relationships that I would never have. And he's going to do things, things I don't even want to do. Mm. And he allows me to do the things I do well. So I think it's a combination of just understanding all the tools that are available to you and leverage the size of some of these other companies that have been in business for 30 years. I mean, why, here's the thing that's crazy. If you're an idea person and you understand licensing and you become an idea factory, the walls just came down. You can do it anytime, any place, anywhere with no money. If I have to start a business on every idea I have, I'll go broke. Right. Explain real quick, Edwin, I like your question. Want to elaborate a little more on it? Uh, yeah, so, you know, I've had some inventions in, thinking about starting the business. And as it grew, I always asked myself the question, should I knock myself off before the others do it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, what are your thoughts on that in general? You're thinking like an entrepreneur. Yes, knock yourself off. I, I love that. You know, it's crazy. Have a high end, have a low end, you know, play that game. Why not? I also believe even take the same Take that same strategy when you file intellectual property. If you're going to file a patent, steal it from yourself. Always look ahead. Look at what the next engineer is going to do. You know, engineers, I love these guys. They can't stop thinking about how to re-engineer everything. Steal it from yourself. Put all the variations, workarounds, manufacturing techniques, everything in that intellectual property to have great value in the marketplace. But if you're going to come out, understand how to make the cheapest one, the middle-sized one, and the most expensive one, Play all the fields. Damn, I love that. All right, let's just kind of wrap this up. Well, you got to, Harry, go, go ahead, Harry. I, I, was say, I made a note a few days ago. Somebody said, uh, come, with, come up with new ideas faster than people can steal them from you. Uh, was, that, was that Stephen that said that? <laughs> you know, because they're, they're going to steal from you. China's going to steal this intellectual property. And that's just a compliment. It means you're on the right path they said and just I think brand is important and um, coming up with ideas faster than than, than people can copy you so appreciate there's, you Stephen yeah there's some other tricks too right I mean there are there are some things you could do um, I wrote an article for Forbes the 17 ways to keep the knockoffs at bay so if you want more information about intellectual property or how to really navigate or read all the information I'm out there I'm all about using practical things you know, and, and how to navigate this world we live in today and how to outsmart the competition. I also believe, um, I think you can avoid a lot of problems by writing intellectual property correctly. I don't think enough people are talking about that either. So I like the game that we're in. It's more exciting, it's fast, it's running fast, it's changing quickly. And you have to, at first of all, you have to gather as much information as you can, find the people that can help you Find the guys that have done it before you and, and make sure you get all that information. And that's why you're here tonight, right? Yeah. And, and you kicked ass. You did a great job. Now, how do we get you to be part of the community, Stephen? You're missing well, I, out. I, I'm fascinated by it. You guys, the more I understand what you guys are doing and the more I see who's involved, I have to admit I'm, I'm a little like blown away. <laughs> Well, let's do this. I'm a Harry, little blown away. Harry, we have a lot. We have a lot of good ideas <laughs> that you can yeah. have. Yeah, but we're executors too. That's the whole idea. Harry's part of Singularity. Uh, I mean, these guys are unfreaking believable. And I think you sitting up in Lake Tahoe is wonderful. But if you want to always be enticed by guys that are thinking light years ahead of you, this is where it's at. It's with us. Yeah, I, I'm seeing that. Yep, I, I am, and. Um... I've noticed that you've got a, a, an amazing group of people coming together. And this is kind of a new experience to me. I didn't know get, 
guys gathered and talked about this stuff. I, I, I'm like, really? Uh, and you do it on Saturdays? Come on. I, I, I like, what's going on with this? So um, you, you've definitely got me interested. And I like that. Um, I like the attitude of helping each other. Yeah, it works well. Well, Mr. Key, I really thank you so much for giving us your time. And uh, we look forward to seeing you part of the community. So hang out. Get in touch. How do Everybody we get in touch with you, Stephen? Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Stephen. Great job. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Bye all. Thanks, guys. Stephen.